ค่ะสวัสดีค่ะ well well nice to see everyone here and welcome to Bangkok for those of you who are uh, maybe here for the first time hope you enjoy Bangkok so far so my talk today is focusing on uh, what we call data for good so is uh, I gonna walk you through like a few uh, concept about geospatial data which is the main uh, tools or skill set that we have been using to develop program uh, or like uh, you know AI platform for our client and also for our partner like UNICEF uh, UNDP so you see how we have you know built those AI in the past and I also have my friends here she gonna share with you about our open source library so I hope you can also contribute to our open source uh, library as well. Just introduce myself a bit first. So my name is Mook, so I lead the Thinking Machine team as our, our, the, our lovely MC just mentioned. And before that, I study at Carnegie Mellon University, so it's famous for AI. It's like out of nowhere in Pittsburgh in the state. And, uh, also, I worked for Temasek for quite some time in Singapore and with Accenture and have a chance to join the MIT uh, Innovation Sandbox programs. Um, my friends here, so we have Ren here. Yeah, so she's she going to share about our open source library in a bit. So she's a bit more technical than me. So any technical question, I will <laughs> hand over to her for, for the answers. She uh, lead our geospatial intelligence, and she have many years of experience working with us and also with our partner, like their NGO, uh, UNICEF and UNDP. Yeah, thank you, Lens. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can go down now. <laughs> so, uh, just a little quick introduction on, on like what is Thinking Machine, right? So we we basically are an international company, but really focus on ASEANs. Uh, we are at we are in Bangkok, Singapore, and Philippines, and we are around two hundred people now. So, what we do, we work with our clients' uh, local here. So, whenever these big company want to develop like AI platform, data platform, they talk to us, and we develop. A solution for them. It's it's super diverse. It could be like a, a leading document. So LOM is really hot right now. So we also do a lot of work in LOM, and then we also do like predictions. There are company who ask us to like predict the oil price. <laughs> that was really challenging. Uh, and you see the big logo from the social impact. So that's what we're gonna focus today is our uh, work with these social impact sectors that uh, I want to talk about. Um, yeah, so uh, before I go into details on like what like what we did, right? The first concept you guys need to to kind of like absorb from me here is the geospatial intelligence. Have any of you have heard about geospatial analytics before? Okay, yes. Yeah, it's pretty pretty familiar with you, right? And if if those of you who didn't raise your hand, you already like using it. It's either to your grab, your food delivery fluid, or your navigation. Before you come here at on note, you already look up your map, right? So that part of the geospatials is the information that relate to locations. And you can use it in so many use cases. It's really good. L let me have a quick quiz for you so, you so you understand what I mean by that. Well, first photo here. You know where it is? Any of you? I don't have a price, but like, yeah, Bangkok, right? So where, where exactly is this in Bangkok? I think you kind of huh? don't work close, close, close. You almost a local now. <laughs> yeah, Suwanapum, right? So this is an airport, right? How how do you know it's an airport? The, there's a long runway, right? And so then if you actually zoom in and you get to see the actually the planes here. And well, for the people who live in Bangkok, I, you probably like know that this is Suwanapum just because you have looked at it before. So you remember it, right? But imagine, let's say, if you want to train your program or your AI to actually recognize that this is an airport. How, how do you do that, right? So this is where the AI and geospatial kind of like work together. So we try to develop a model that recognize stuff on the map. And this is just the first example. So it's an airport, right? Easy. Well, this one, where is it? This is also easy. 
is a really well organized city. I think they do a better job than Bangkok in uh, organizing their road. Yes, correct. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, this part is right. And actually, you can see this is Eiffel Tower, but it's just a top down view, right? And the road is so well structured. You have like a really big like uh, fields here. There's a river here. And but look at the map. You can already say that well, this is somewhat a well developed country, like based on the road structure, based on how they map out their city plannings and like the buildings and such, right? So it's not it's not it's not gonna be in let's say like Southeast Asia, right? If if you guess, right? The next one. Where is this? Or just like countries or cities, okay. <laughs> I'm just looking at the front rows. <laughs> Anyone? Just continent? Philippines? Close, close. It's in Asia. Actually, this is just my grandma house. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so it's in Bangkok. It's just in my grandma house. But the, the things here you see, this is like, it's a single house. It's not like attached building, right? So you can you can somewhat say that this is like a pretty okay neighborhood. They have like structure. They have like walls. You know, it's not like uh, area where like there's like no like clear wall and such. And you can even see that like this is probably like a uh, solar sails on top, right? Yeah. So so this is like just how you observe like buildings and what it say about the locations. Well, this is getting a bit more interesting. This is also house buildings, but is do you can you guess where it is? It's probably not in Bangkok anymore, right? Yeah, in the US. How how do you know who said US? I I heard some. What? How how do you know that it's in the US? Big backyard. Big road. Yeah, yeah, that's that correct. <laughs> He's so good. So it's in the U.S. So the house in the U.S. they have like like backyard, they have big road, and uh, you see a lot of solar panel here. One of our project is actually to count the solar panel, or like actually estimate that is this a good location for people to put their solar cell on top of their house, right? So this is one of the way you can use. Um, you know, geospatial to actually tell story. But this is interesting, let's say, if you zoom out, what happening here? Oh, come on, this is easy. What's happening here? Fire, right? So there's a big fire happening. Just zoom out a bit from the lovely neighborhood, there's like big fire going on. And it's actually not a small one. <laughs> it's really a big fire. So this is from uh, Hawaii. So have you heard about the news where we have a big fire in Hawaii, right? So another use case in geospatial, you can look at the change of the landscape. And it also tell another story on like what actually happened in the area, right? So this is how wide, and there must be something about this. Like I'm not sure how they protect their houses from the fires, but yeah, <laughs> this is cool. Another one. Um, this is the last one. I promise you, this is like the last one. <laughs> so this one will probably a forest, which, but instead of like where it is, like, do you know what happened here? It's just like what happened in this area. Can I guess? No? Huh? Rotting? Fraudded? Yeah, it's close. So that's something wrong with the, the forest, right? Yeah, so that's something happened here. Um, let me show you. So this is actually a forest in, yeah, let it rotate a bit. In this part of the world, this is in uh, near the Amazon rivers. So what happened here? What you see here is a big deforestation. So, uh, so it's a big deforestation here. So as I mentioned, geospatial super powerful if you combine it with a time series data, 
right? So I'm going to show you. Uh, so this is what happened, right? Uh, let, well, sorry, did, did you see that? Let me do it again. So if you start the time lab feature, this is just Google Earth, back in 1990 something, it's like, it's so green. It's like, you, you start seeing some deforestation, but it's not that bad. But eventually, once you start, you know, the timers, well, a lot of green area disappear, and it becomes, I, I don't know what, like, people houses? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. And at the end, it's nowadays, like, completely uh, gone. Yep. So this is geospatial. Right, combining with time labs and time CV data, so it tells so many stories. We have used it in many. Uh, where's my? Oh, here. <laughs> we have used it in in, in like many areas, but today in particular, we're gonna focus on the non-profit sectors, right? So we have been using it to, of course, detect the deforestation, as you just mean, like you just seen it, and also like crime metrics uh, detect like poverty level in each area, we have been doing that. So let me walk you to like what, what kind of data you can detect from just the satellite image, right? So you, you already seen it's like demographics. Um, it's not from the satellite image, but together with third party data, you can actually know that in this area, what is the population density, what is the age, uh, Groups. So, for example, Facebook also have those data, so you can actually use like call Facebook data for that. It's not specific. Again, this is like it's gonna break the PDPA. It's, it's like aggregate level, right? It's like per per province, per uh, tambo noam per. The next one is mobilities. Uh, as you just see, so we can detect the change, and the change eventually lead to like mobilities, how people move. Or we can also use the Google map, of course, the data from like foot traffic or vehicle traffic and such. Infrastructure, we also just experience that. So it's like buildings, how many buildings in that area is also really powerful knowledge, right? Let's say if you are a real estate, you would like to know like in this area, how dense is the area, like who lives there, what's the building type. So these are just the information. Point of interest, uh, like, is there a big mall, schools, hospital in the area that also tell how uh, people live in such area? Um, finance, this is also interesting. There are a lot of third party data out there that tell you exactly like how much people can spend based on their information in specific areas. Um, like their yeah, you can talk to me after, but it's not free, I'm going to say. Most of the time, they sell this data. They aggregate data from like credit card, like the Visa and MasterCard, and they, they, they sell it to, to like uh, people who want to use it for other purpose. Yeah. Uh, so that was our geospatial, right? Let me just walk through the case studies a bit. Uh, we already talked about this. The first case studies uh, I want to talk about is the climate change. Um, we have partner with our partner from Conservation International and also the, the, uh, the Arizona State University, sorry, it's, it's been a while. But what we do for this use case is that the NGO come to us and they were like, oh, we have a plan. We, we want to help people who grow shrimps. So it's an aqua farm, like farm gung. Nah. So they want to help with the aqua shrimps. Like how do you actually help the farmer be more efficient in growing shrimps. On the other hand, they want to protect the mangrove forest. Right? They want to protect pa uh, gong gang. So because most of the time the shrimps, like the aqua farm, is located really close to the mangrove forest. And if you don't do it properly, then you destroy the mangrove forest, which is bad, right? So they come to us and, well, we are not a streams or aqua farm expertise, but what can what we can do for the, the NGO is that we can help them detect the area. Because this program they want to launch it in like Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia. So the the area is so big, right? So they don't know where they should focus, like they sh where should they send their stuff to like do the things that they're good at. So we help them by develop a model that can 
uh, tell them exactly where is the location that they should go and look at the aqua farm. So a few steps. Well, I'll keep it simple. Well, you need to be able to detect where is the aqua cultures, where is the open waters, and where is the green area, right? And then uh, you also need to know. Um, you, you need to have a, a model to like classify the aqua farm. So they explicitly ask us to pick the natural pond over the industrial pond. Why is that? Because the industrial one is already really good, right? They just want to help people who still like need help. So those mean the na the natural pond. And if you see from the photos, it's um it's already somewhat different. Like the color is different, the structures of the pond is different. Like the industrial one have a clear boundaries. The color also different. So that's how we train the the AI to classify the the pond, and eventually it become uh, a visualization like this. So we build them a web app, and then they can click on the earlier or the 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 map would tell them specifically that, hey, this area, the suitable scrolling is around 70%. Maybe you want to take a look or send someone to actually talk to the farm. So these are one of the examples for the aqua farm. So as, as in my workshop title, right? so this is the farmer that I mentioned. Um, so quickly for another use case, um, we also have help with the migration crisis. So back in 2014, this is a while back, we, there's a situation where the Venezuela is having financial crisis and a lot of people migrate out. So they migrate to other countries. And again, so the NGO people come to us and they were like, can you actually help us detect where the immigration, like where the immigrant move to? Like where, where's their next like destinations? Where do they settle down? So they can send the aid. Like the, so the UNICEF people, they can like send the aid that the people need, like in the right location and like on the right time, right? Um, so this is what we did. So we partner with the UNICEF and our like lovely lady here, the, the lady in gray, she is our thinking machine staff. So she had to fly all the way to like South America. And then she talked to the local people. She observed how the settlement look like because we have to train the model to detect the settlement. Right? So the settlement looks something like this. It's not a well-structured house. It's like this green niche like with the cloth and with like wooden things. So anything that they can find on the garden, they build it to a settlement. So we develop a model to detect these kind of settlement. And um, as you already experienced from my exercise before, we use the time lab, right? We, we combine the satellite image with the time CD data. So we know where are the changes and eventually you would know where the people migrate to. So this is another uh, solution that, that we have built for the UNICEF. Well, it's not as simple as I just mentioned. There's a lot of complexity behind the scene, like um, how do you remove the cloud that's like crowdies on top of satellite image, or uh, how do you optimize the model because not all the image have like good qualities. Sometimes the quality of the image is really bad. So the engineer have to like optimize their uh, models along the way. This is just example, right? So Google Earth is really good, is really clear. Uh, but actually for this project, what we decide to use is this one. A bit more blurry, but we decide to use the, the, the one below just because if you use the, the Google Earth, it's so expensive. It's, like <laughs> it's so expensive to land the models and like also to, to procure the image. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and again, the outcome looks something like this. So we develop a visualization for them, and it would like highlight the location where the immigrant locate. Yeah, so these are all the colors, and uh, and at the end, the UNICEF people will send someone to that location and validate the model. Like, is is this really correct? And then if it's correct, then they take action after that. But what what? The model is like not 100% accurate, right? It's always not going to be 100% accurate. But we already trimmed down like the earlier for them, so that already speed up the the NGO's uh, process. 
Yeah. Uh, next part. So I have my friend Renz here because I know this is pie corn and you, I need some Python. <laughs> Sorry, that's a pun. I try my best. <laughs> so she's going to share about our uh, open source library so you can also use our open source libraries and like maybe contribute back to it as well. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Again, my name is Ren. Um, thank you for having me here today. So thank you, Mook, for um, sharing the wonderful uses of geospatial AI. Um, and now let's go into how can we actually use Python to do this cool stuff that she just shared. So I'll be talking about GeoWrangler. This is a open source library that we developed um, in collaboration with UNICEF. Oh, there. So the context here is, um, if you look online, there is going to be a lot of available open data sets um, for geospatial. There's a lot of um, data sets released by um, civic organizations and academic um, institutions and research facilities such as Meta, um, giving you different data sets in social demographics, um, uh, useful environmental information that you can use for conservation. And there is so much data in, um, in this space. And you can actually use all these data sets in some of the very cool use cases that Mook shared, and generally in any of these three. So social economics, you can use it for um, planning um, for uh, has planning for hazard. You can use it for carbon offsetting, like our CI um, part, um, our partnership with Conservation International, as well as in urban planning. But the blocker here is transforming geospatial data for um, advanced analytics can be quite complex. So um, earlier, Mook asked you who here has heard of geospatial or GIS analytics. Um, only a few people have raised their hands. So our goal here is actually to help um, developers break into this kind of analytics. So we wanted to create reusable and open source tools to simplify and speed up geospatial data transformation. So we wanted to create the building blocks so that we can speed up how um, these open geospatial data sets are used and open up these, um, the opportunity to more developers to actually practice geospatial analytics. So in partnership with UNICEF um, through um, AI for Development or AI4D, um, we develop these building blocks. So these consist mostly of novel AI applications that are open source, so you can find the code um, in, GitHub, in GitHub and actually replicate the study. So we do this for air quality mapping in Thailand, as well as relative wealth mapping, so you can estimate the relative wealth of an area across any country in Southeast Asia. And then um, we also have GeoWrangler, so this is the um, geospatial data um, data transformation library that we created, and, as, and more resources that you can find in AI4D Research Bank. So these are um, catalogs of models and data sets that you can quickly access for um, different use cases in social, and social impact and sustainability. So today I'll focus on GeoWrangler because we are devs. Um, so we created GeoWrangler as a, um, a Python package to cut down the development time for geodata. So there are a lot of very common workflows or pipelines that we use to transform geospatial data set. And we actually um, codified, already codified the building blocks for those in GeoWrangler so that people can already easily access them. They don't have to start from scratch anymore and work on the optimization themselves or alone. Um, they are already here in GeoWrangler. So this helps developers and researchers break into geospatial analytics, even if you have zero to, uh, little to zero context about um, GIS. This can already help you be more familiar with that. Um, this also minimizes the time spent um, individually recreating these common workflows because um, we've worked in a lot of use cases, we've worked with a lot of other groups that do geospatial analytics, and um, a lot of these processes, 90% um, of the time, they are um, the same things that we do. So um, might as well create a standardized version of it, right? And hopefully this helps foster um, research for GIS applications and development and sustainability. So what can you do with GeoWrangler? So um, first, and my favorite is it allows you to easily download the common open geospatial data sets. So this is um, nighttime lights, which is a great indicator for economic um, activity in the area as well as um, urbanization of the area. Um, 
and you also have OpenStreetMaps, as well as um, Ookla Internet Speed, which are all great um, social development indicators. You can also generate area statistics um, for vectors and rasters. So these are geospatial data formats. So um, GeoWrangler can already support you in processing these data sets, as well as detect potential silent errors in processing those data sets. So quickly giving you um, an example of a common geospatial data um, workflow. So if you are going to use um, geospatial data and machine learning applications, this is the very the first step. So you have to create um, you have to create uh, divide your study area into smaller area, um, smaller parts like these grid tiles, and you have to connect your multiple geospatial data sets to each of those tiles. So we call that like layering on different data sets as your features um, in training a model. So let's see how that works in GeoWrangler. So first, we also have a feature that can easily connect you to Bing tiles in H3. So this already gives you a quick access to a grid um, with unique IDs that also mesh well with other open data sets, meaning other open data sets also use these tiles so you don't need to do um, the, time, uh, the computationally expensive spatial joints. You can do um, joints using IDs. Um, yeah, and then... As I mentioned, you can already do aggregate statistics for um, these different data sets. It can, um, you can also use it to derive new information. So for example, um, first here, you are um, counting the number of schools in a particular area. Let's say 500 square meter areas. How many schools are there? How many hospitals? But you can also get the average distance of that tile from the nearest school if there is no school present in that area. You can also do this for the other data, um, data format, which is called rasters. So ras essentially, um, the pixels of each image represent a um, value associated to the area on the ground. So let's say um, the temperature. So you can use this to get the average temperature for a 500 square meter area. Um, so quickly wrapping up here. You can actually experience um, using GeoWrangler firsthand through our demo. So if you don't know where to start, you can simply um, uh, scan this QR and it'll give you um, access to our collab um, demo for GeoWrangler, where we have already built out um, like how you can use the functions um, in GeoWrangler. So um, also calling out calling here for um, more help and support in developing GeoWrangler. If you are a new user, we would very much like to hear your feedback, as well as give us an idea on what um, other features we, um, would, you would find useful for our, um, in this library. Uh, lastly, if you're already a GIS professional, um, ha uh, hat tip to those who raised their hands earlier, you can also help us contribute to the library by following our guidelines here for contribution. So that um, wraps up my uh, very quick segment. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, turning it. Thank you, Renz. And I have to do thank you, PyCon, for intro, like, <laughs> invited me. So I really want to do this. So we are, <laughs> we are hiring. So if any of you, you know, want to work in, like, something cool like this, what we just mentioned, we are looking for data engineers, machine learning engineers, and especially people who are really good at both technical and communications, we are looking for you. So uh, reach out to us. <laughs> thank you so much. Huh?